me in your Bibles to Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 24. Uh, this is uh, one of the many lectionary readings for this Sunday, this Pentecost Sunday. Again, a day when uh, the Church Universal acknowledges 50 days after resurrection, uh, the literal, uh, if you will, um, outpouring of God's Spirit, the, the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to the disciples that he would send a comforter. And that comforter, that power of the Spirit would live and dwell and empower them to do greater works than even Jesus did. And so these passages of Scripture that have been given to the church on this Sunday is indeed an opportunity for you and I to lean into and to embrace the power of not just resurrection, but the power of the one, the spirit that makes resurrection possible. I want to keep reminding you that we are people of resurrection. I want to keep reminding you that even with all that is happening, uh, that God knows how to turn a death-filled situation into a situation of possibility in life. And so turn your attention to this text. Uh, it is coming from the book of Numbers. Uh, the book of Numbers is in the Hebrew scriptures. We sometimes refer to it as the Old Testament. Uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then we have Numbers. So turn your attention there with us. Uh, chapter number 11, verse 24. Just to give you a quick context of this particular passage, uh, the children of Israel have made it out of Egypt. Uh, they are indeed on their journey to the promised land. Um, and yet they are going through a 40-day a, a journey that has been extended over 40 years because for many of them, they uh, were so filled with the, 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 the sensibilities of their oppressor that they could not fully break free enough to enter into the promised land. And so the scripture says that God led Moses who then led the children of Israel through the desert for 40 years using a pillar of fire in the nighttime and a pillar of clouds in the daytime. That God was leading the children of Israel through a very tumultuous journey and fire and clouds were used to help guide their journey. And so when we come to this passage, You'll see the use of fire in so many different ways, uh, particularly at the top of this passage, uh, the, the disbelief and the, and the, the, the rebellion, uh, the attempted coups continually of the people of Moses' leadership as he was being led by God. Literally, uh, the scriptures uh, describe God's uh, anger and frustration that from time to time it would boil over with fire. And there's all kind of theological conversation we could have about should we take that literally? What does that say about the character of God? I will just certainly say that the, the, the theological uh, uh, impulse of the writers of these early uh, books of the Torah had such an all-consuming uh, attribution and vision of God that they attributed everything that happened to God. Either God allowed their enemies to overtake them or God fully delivered them. And so even when they realized that there was disobedience and frustration, uh, sometimes I, I believe we can attribute to God uh, those things that are just a consequence of some of our own missteps. But God is always, even in God's anger, frustration with us, always present, not to consume us, to destroy us, but to lead us through the wilderness until we make it to the promised land. And so in Numbers chapter 11, Moses, overwhelmed with the leadership of this nation, this band of survivors from a death plague and 400 years enslaved in Egypt, Moses is leading them. Moses getting overwhelmed by the burden of leading these people. And so God tells Moses to choose you 70 elders, choose you some from uh, the, the nation that can help you carry this load. And Moses indeed follows the counsel of God. And we pick that up then here in verse number 24. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. And Moses brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with 
Moses. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. Verse 26, however, <clears throat> two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp and they were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. Verse 27, a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since you, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? And this is going to be the, the, the meat of our sermon today. Moses' response, simply this, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put the spirit on all of them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel return to the camp. I want you to say this with me wherever you are. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Say that again. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. Now make it personal and say, and that the Lord would put the spirit, pat yourself on the chest and say, on me, on me. Make your hand a wide and say, on us. God wants to have the rising of the prophets. And that will be the title of my message today, The Rise of the Prophets. Bow your heads with me and let us pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that we have read that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been for us a pillar of cloud and a, a pillar of fire in both our day and nighttime seasons. I pray that the word, Lord, will speak to us and even on this Pentecost Sunday as Many are saying all across the world, Holy Spirit, fall fresh on me. May the power of your spirit, the fire of your spirit fall fresh on all of us. Touch me, God. May I preach your word, hiding behind your cross. May the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy rest on even me and the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. The rise of the prophets. Now, it, it, it certainly is worth our attention on, on Pentecost Sunday to, to at least gesture at the book of Acts chapter 2 that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter stood up with the 11 in verse number 14, raised his voice, addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who are in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what this prophet spoke in Joel chapter 2. I love this passage. This is one of the most important passages that help to define the ministry and the vision of the way church. We are a church that believes in the power of the spirit that literally Pentecost Sunday is every Sunday. Pentecost is every day. The spirit is always wanting to pour itself out on you. And so this is the most important verse that I want you to embrace as you think about, should I uh, be open and, and believing that even in this season of despair and trouble and trial, is the spirit wanting to be poured out in my life? The scripture says in verse 17 that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Somebody say all flesh. All flesh, meaning that your sons and daughters will prophesy. 
Your young men will see dreams and visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord and everyone. Somebody say everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This idea that God is pouring out God's spirit on all flesh is a great blessing to all of us who have historically not been included in the all flesh conversation. When he says all flesh and he says your sons and daughters will prophesy, the, the, the Lord is speaking to the, the, the barriers that some would place around gender. That the ability to prophesy is only reserved for those who are men. No, this passage says all flesh. Somebody say all flesh. The scripture talks about young men will see dreams and old men will see uh, visions. Uh, the scripture speaks to the uh, topic of ageism, often used as an artificial barrier to try to suggest that only certain people of certain age and certain education, certain experience can be uh, experiencing the idea of the spirit, spirit being poured out. But I want you to know this reminds us that all flesh counts for even those who may be young or who may be old. Somebody say all flesh. <clears throat> and we know that when it says, and even on my servants, both men and women, that the scripture is speaking specifically to the challenge of class, the challenge of difference around income, around social status, that servant or, or leader or, or wherever you are socially located. This passage is declaring that even on you, God is not preferring one or the other. All flesh means all flesh. That everyone, that, that word is such an all-encompassing word. Why? Because it leaves, uh, it includes everyone that you and I like to leave out. So some of us who are feminist, boy, you know, we, we, may, we may have a very broad circle of belonging, uh, and, and, but this, this even expands beyond that. Some of us who, who like to center patriarchy, some of us who like to center nationalism, some of us who like to center our race or our culture, the everyone word forces all of us to be even more broad than what we think we already are. Because truth be told, no matter how progressive you are, all of us got, uh, you know, our little uh, limits to our belonging circles. Some of us can't accept everybody at the same time. And so this passage, even in this moment of division, is challenging you that Pentecost requires us to be open to everyone. Why? Because God says, I'm pouring out my spirit on all flesh, on everyone. I want you right now to see yourself as a valued and prioritized recipient of God's spirit for the purpose of you to rise up as a prophet of this time. God wants the prophets of the most high to rise up everywhere. I want you to see yourself on this Pentecost Sunday, not as the recipient of the spirit. So you can just sit and soak in the basking glory of God. So you can become a spiritually obese person that only receives the spirit for your own personal benefit. No, for this moment, you must receive the spirit so you can stand up and prophesy. And I want you right now to just ask the Lord, Lord, may your spirit rest on me so I can rise up and prophesy. What is at stake if you don't rise up and prophesy? Well, what is at stake is that the work of the enemy will use other kinds of instruments and tools to try and have a voice and a proclamation a bold proclamation of the, the, the value of our humanity and the wickedness of their own intent. Oh, I want you to understand this, child of God, that one of the great, the great uh, uh, evils of the lynching of our dear brother George Floyd 
on TV for all of us to see. One of the great uh, evils of the killing of Tony McDade in Tallahassee. One of the great evils of Breonna Taylor being shot down in her own home. One of the great evils of Ahmad being shot down while he's running is that these are public lynchings that are tied to a historical effort to spread fear among black people and others who do not fit in the circle of belonging of a narrow vision of humanity proposed by this empire. This empire is attempting to proclaim its own message of who is human, of who is created in the image of God. And so the reason the lynching of George Floyd has sparked protest across this country, has bothered many of us so much, is because in a time when lynchings were used to intimidate, this particular lynching has had the total opposite effect. It has emboldened some of us to ask God for a different kind of spirit. It has emboldened some of us to say, I refuse to be silent in the face of white supremacy and otherism and death and pillage and bondage. I refuse to be an agent complicit in my own oppression. No, right now, this lynching of George Floyd has brought so much trauma up for so many of us that we're saying we refuse to be silent. We are rising up as prophets. And I want you to know, child of God, that it is important for you to understand that George Lynch did nothing wrong, that Tony McDay did nothing wrong, that, that Breonna Taylor did nothing wrong, that your loved one that may be an immigrant, undocumented, may not uh, be rich and may not fit into the social status of this country. We are not doing anything wrong to deserve the death and the, the focus of this empire's most wicked impulses. No, Pastor Tracy Blackman, she says it best like this that it is impossible to be unharmed when my blackness is the weapon you fear. Hear me on this, child of God. Pastor Tracy Blackman says it so powerfully. It is impossible to be unarmed, to not be considered a threat, to not be considered something to be disposed of when my blackness is the weapon you fear. I thank God for the voice of women like Pastor Tracy Blackman who help us to clarify what the moment really is about. This isn't about the criminality of black people. This is about the wickedness of white supremacy that has run amok in this world. And the irony of all of this hand wringing over burnt up buildings and over the, the protests of people in the streets is that when Colin Kaepernick, our dear brother, who was a quarterback of my favorite football team, the San Francisco 49ers, knelt down to silently protest the wickedness of this empire when he was joined by Eric Reed and a number of these football players and then sports figures across the world, we had white folk and some bougie other kind of folk sitting up talking about they ought to not do that because that's too disruptive. You ought to be professional. Don't mix politics with your job and with my sports. The devil is a lie. You don't want the silent protest of Colin Kaepernick, but now you don't want the verbal protest of people who are having their heads cracked by the wickedness of this empire. That means you want our silence. But I hear God saying the rise of the prophets of the people of God means we we will not remain silent. You can't remain silent and have the Holy Ghost. You can't remain silent and be a spirit-filled believer. You can't remain silent and say that you follow God and watch God's creation be broken in two. No, it's time for you and I to rise up. You ought to just say that, I'm going to rise up. I am a prophet and I'm going to rise up and take my rightful place. On the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place, unified, and the spirit fell on everyone. In the book of Numbers, uh, Moses, trying to lead the people through a very uh, challenging journey, he was overwhelmed, and God sent the spirit to be poured out. I want to let you know this one truth. When the task is too great, God will always send Pentecost. When the challenge is too big for one person, one people to handle, God will send Pentecost to empower and broaden the number of hands and bodies to accomplish the goal. 
And the power of Pentecost in this moment, we're seeing it in the streets. We're seeing the most multiracial crowd of witnesses that are out in the streets protesting, calling out the wicked behavior of a system that will not only kill, but not hold accountable those who kill. As long as they wear a uniform, as long as they are white, because I want you to know, even though some of our loved ones who are black and brown and Asian and who are non-white and they are police officers, they are more likely to be convicted of a misconduct case than their white counterparts. Can you believe that in Minneapolis, the only cop they've ever convicted of, 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 of police misconduct in the most recent times was a black man? We should teach some of us that it don't matter what kind of profession you get into. You must keep speaking out because your silence will kill you. Your silence will still leave you in the throes of the whims of a wicked empire. So you and I must ask ourselves, how must we rise up as prophets? The task of this moment of this season is still too great for one people to bear. Wouldn't it be amazing if the nation had a Pentecost, not that just re relegated us to great church, to better church, to being able to have big buildings and, 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 and great worship and, and, and great choirs. I love all of that. I'm gonna have all of that experience until uh, I leave here to go be with the Lord in glory. But I want you to know Pentecost ain't for just good church. Pentecost is to empower you and me and we to do the work of God in the world. Pentecost is meant to lift up the, the, the we, the power of our collective strengths and gifts. The day of Pentecost, one accord produced different languages. I'm going to say that again. One accord, one unity produced different results of the same mission. It should help you today to remember that unity does not mean uniformity. That just like your body is not all the same thing, your body, what defines it is the difference that comes together through the physiological coordination of the impulses in your brain, uh, sending messages to the rest of your body to function in a certain kind of way. Your body has unity, but it does not have uniformity. In your family, you can experience a Pentecost without everybody doing and being the same. You can be unified on your job without everybody doing and looking the same. You can have unity in this country without everybody looking and being the same, but it still requires that when we are working through a Pentecostal framework, we still are breathing life into dead things. We still are resurrecting people from the dead. You want to know how we are so clear that this culture and this time is not being moved by Pentecost because there is so much disunity and the worst that we are producing are death filled. Too many people are dying. Too many people are suffering. Too many people are experiencing the isolation of this wicked empire. But I love the book of Numbers, this passage. It gives you and I such a wonderful, wonderful uh, framework for how to appreciate the rise of the prophets. You hear Moses in this passage. He's overwhelmed. How many of you are overwhelmed? <laughs> How many of you feel like you carrying so much? Oh my goodness, I might not be leading somebody through a wilderness to get to the promised land. I'm just trying to wake up every day in a pandemic and get back to bed at night without losing my mind. You overwhelmed because you, you, you parent children who still have to go to schools or walk to the stores or play in the park and you're afraid that as soon as you send them out the door, that may be the last time you see them, you're overwhelmed because your money has gotten funny, your honey has gotten strange, everything that you thought was stable has destabilized and you feel overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed because your body is racked with pain and you are sick and you don't feel like you have your health. You're overwhelmed. You don't need a national tragedy to feel overwhelmed. But I hear God saying that when you are overwhelmed, that's when I want to send a Pentecost. 
I want to send the power of my spirit to be poured out so all flesh, somebody say it again, all flesh, all flesh can experience this power. Well, in this text, Moses, overwhelmed, hear, heard God say, well, find you some help, man. And I want you to hear that. Find you some help, sis, loved one, relative. Find you some help. Don't drown in the feeling of being overwhelmed. Don't drown in the tidal wave of the wickedness and the failure of those systems or those around you. Get you some help. And so Moses finds him 70 reliable people that he thought could help him. He was led by the spirit to find him a crew, to find him a crowd that could have his back. It reminds you and I that we should never walk through life alone. You ought to get you a crowd. Well, we put that in the chat, say, I need to get me a crowd. I need to get my 70, my 25, my 10. I need to get me a few folk that can have my back, that can pray for me. We're going through this consecration. Wouldn't it be amazing if you got a few folks that could pray with you through the consecration? Get you a crowd of folk that'll fast with you. Get you a crowd of folk that'll wake up early in the morning and pray with you. Get you a crowd of people that can walk with you through this season of feeling overwhelmed. I love how Moses in calls these 70 and he calls them into a tent. He calls them away from the camp because Moses didn't want them to be too preoccupied with what was happening in the camp. Moses had to pull some folks away. So he pulls them away and he brings them to a place and the scripture says that God poured out God's spirit on them and they prophesied one time. They received the spirit, one touch, and it gave them the ability to prophesy. But there were a couple people who Moses picked out. Ill, Ill dad and me dad, ill dad and me dad. And the scripture says that they were in the camp. They didn't make it outside the camp. They stayed in the camp and God poured out God's spirit on ill dad and me dad. I want you to know that the great gift of what God does is sometimes we'll have our own infrastructure set up to, to manage the move of God. But God will sometimes remind us that your structure is not all uh, encompassing of the way I want to move. Sometimes I'm going to even pour out my spirit outside the places that you try to domesticate my spirit. God saying that ill dad and me dad had an experience of the spirit outside the camp. And the beauty of their experience is that as they who were with Moses outside the camp prophesied one time, the scripture says that ill dad and me dad kept on prophesying. They kept on prophesying. It wasn't just a one-time thing. It became an everyday thing, an ongoing thing. And I want to say this to you right now. Not all of us will be called to prophesy all the time. Some of us will only do a one-time wonder. You're going to be like Millie Vanilli, a one-hit wonder. You're going to be like, I don't know, uh, uh, J John Day, the one-hit wonder. But some of us are going to be some perpetual prophesying people. And when that spirit hits you, I want you to embrace the one times, the two times, or the three times that the spirit is inviting you to prophesy. Not all of us are called to the same thing, but there are times when we must engage in the same function. Did you hear me on that? Not all of you will be called to prophesy every day, but there will be a moment where we all must be engaging in the same function. And this is that time. We are in a time where we need the rise of all the prophets. The prophet must have the ability to speak clearly to the hurting of the people and then call people to repentance. Somebody say prophesy. The prophet must be willing to hold the way that the world is and still high have eyes of faith to, to proclaim the world as it should be. Somebody say prophesy. The prophet must listen, remain proximal to the suffering of others and not become social media prophets and warriors. Where you, you sound good on social media, you, you, you sound good on social media typing away, but when it comes to actually prophesying to a real person or a real system, you're nowhere to be found. Prophets must be on fire. 
filled with the fire of God. For what purpose, you may say? Well, let me give you these three things that 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 this scripture tells us and our experience teaches us prophets must be able to do. Prophets must prophesy bad news to the oppressor. Your job, our job as a prophet is not to parrot the, the talking points of the empire. It is not to repeat the lies of the wicked. The prophet must proclaim bad news to the oppressor. You must be willing to tell the oppressor, your time is up, the jig is up, it is over for your wickedness. It is time for you and I to embrace the call of the prophet to tell the empire some bad news. Now this is what I found. It's kind of hard for some of us to tell the empire bad news because we don't have the right analysis. Our analysis has been too informed by the analysis of our enemy. And when you don't have the right analysis, even the bad news you're telling the oppressor can be interpreted as good news to the oppressor. Too many folk who claim to be prophets or priests of the Most High are reinforcing the very things that God says God is against. God tells us that we are to love justice and do mercy and walk humbly with God and one another. How can you proclaim good news to wicked dictator like uh, political leaders and dishonest business folk and the plutocrats? How can you not, uh, get next to them and praise them and say that you are a prophet of God? No. You must then stay close to the suffering of people. You must cause uh, that, with, that which, which animates the ears of God. That which moves the heart of God. It must move your heart. Pastor Ben said it so powerfully. If the, the burning bush is speaking, why isn't it that we can hear it? Maybe it's because we have yet to align our ears with God's ears and our hearts with God's heart. When you get too proximal to the powerful, your discernment of God's will to the marginalized gets cloudy. This is to all my business leaders and some of you faith leaders and church folk out here who are more upset at burnt buildings and, and busted out windows than you are at the outrage of market capitalistic forces that have created one of the worst economic disparities in the history of this country, I tell you, get your priorities straight. For corporations have willingly plunged and looted our communities for centuries never paying their fair share, never giving folks a wage that allows them to support their families. Even our white brothers and sisters who too often have been sucked up into the lie of capitalistic uh, ascent have, have themselves been victimized through a level of poverty that is crushing to their dreams and their imagination. But because they can't see it, they will support the plutocrats and the wicked who continue to uh, consume all of these resources for themselves. Folk mad about build burning buildings. You were not mad two weeks ago when $500 billion was, was looted out of our general budgets and given to corporations. You mad about Target? Why are you mad about Target? Target is a billion dollar corporation. They got insurance. Ain't nobody shopping at Target anyway during a pandemic. They about to get paid. They about to get paid. Don't be upset about Target when you won't be upset about the black boy who lives in East Oakland who's still getting shot down in the street, about the Latino and immigrant and Dominican loved ones who are being locked up in cages and they're away from their families. And it's because of the wicked diabolical leadership of a president and a Republican Party and too many milk toast Democrats that won't stand up and proclaim the reign of God on earth. Don't be mad at a busted out building be upset about a busted down body it's time for somebody to prophesy 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 some bad news 
to your oppressor. Prophesy some bad news to your politician friends. I'm here to tell you today that violence is more than property damage. I love Coretta Scott's quote here. Let me find her quote because her quote is so powerful. Coretta Scott King, this is what she says. She says that a starving a child is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her family is violence. Discriminating against a working man is violence. Gentrification is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. All these forms of violence, contempt for the poor, is violence. If you're going to be upset about some violence, child of God, get upset about the violence that's happening every day to you, to your family, to your church loved ones to our unhoused loved ones, to the poor in other countries. Get upset about the right kind of violence and rise up in the power of the Pentecostal spirit and boldly proclaim the word of the Lord. Lord, I got to wrap up here. Oh my goodness. So let me ask you a question. What internal and external factors seek to silence your prophetic work to the oppressors around you. Ask yourself the question, what internal and external factors are silencing your prophecy to the oppressors around you? Can you commit this week to delivering some bad news to some oppressors? Woo, I want you to pick up your phone this week, call your mayor, call your sheriff, Call your district attorney. Call your, 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 uh, the, the president of the police union. Call your judge. Call your senator. Call your congressperson and give them some bad news. Yes. Tell them that the way you are leading is destroying the bodies and the people of the earth. And have no fear, loved one. You don't got to go that high. If you're too nervous to call them, Look around your community. Look within your family. Deliver some bad news to some oppressors, some people who are abusive and death dealing, and tell them their time is up. The second thing that I'll say is that if you are a prophet that's getting ready to rise up, listen, you are a prophet that must make room for more prophets. Come on, say that. Make room for more prophets. Make room for more prophets. Oh, Joshua, he was, he was upset that there were some folk prophesying in the camp. And this is what Moses told him. Don't be a hater. Don't be no hater. <laughs> Don't be no hater. Because God is rising up some prophets beside myself. This is what Moses told Joshua, Moses is speaking to us today. I wish that all God's people would prophesy. I wish that everybody had the ability to stand in the courage and the fire of the spirit of God and boldly proclaim the reign of God in the world. I'm here to tell you, you got to make room for some prophets. You got to make room for these young people who are prophets. They prophesying in a way that don't sound like good news to you. But I love how in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says uh, that on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and folk heard the good news in their own language. Uh, how many of you know that how you prophesy might not be able to reach some of these young people, but God got some young folk around you God got some queer folk around you. God got some women folk around you. God got some rich folk, some poor folk. God got some Americans. God got some non-Americans that can boldly proclaim the word of God with the good news in a language that someone can understand. And it's time for you and I to make room for more prophets. Open up your ears to the way God may speak through others for this future that we got to live out together. I want you to know that there are many prophetic voices that are being marginalized because some of us 
want to hoard the space of being prophets. But I want you to know that if God is pouring out God's spirit on all flesh, there is no scarcity when it comes to the outpouring of God's spirit. There's room for everybody to prophesy. There's room for everybody to boldly proclaim. On your job, in your home, on the street corner, boldly proclaim the truth and the liberating power of God, the good news. So everybody can hear it. And finally, I want you to know the reason why it's time for prophets to rise up is because we must prophesy good news to the hurting. We must prophesy good news to the hurting. I don't want you to be overly obsessed with the oppressor and forget that some of us are being called to speak good news to the oppressed, to the hurting among us. These young people out here in the streets, they're hurting. Our unhoused loved ones, they're hurting. Our incarcerated loved ones, they're hurting. Our deported and detained loved ones, they're hurting. Folks are hurting. And the rise of the prophets is about us proclaiming good news to the hurting. What is the good news of God? That the spirit is being poured out even on them. And that every one of them that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Even in a pandemic, God is saying there's good news that we can proclaim to the hurting among us. That the spirit of the living God is being poured out in a way where you and I don't have to only be driven by the despair and the hopelessness that the empire and evil forces would want to throw upon us. In your home, be a prophet and proclaim good news to your children. When you wake up in the morning, look you in the mirror and declare good news to yourself. Find you a therapist that you can lay down on a couch or sit in a chair and they can proclaim good news to you about your healing. Keep telling yourself, I am not the worst mistake I've ever done. The good news of the Spirit of God means that I and we must proclaim good news to all who are oppressed. I want you to know, child of God, it's time for the prophets to rise up. It's time for you to rise up. It's time for us to rise up in this moment. Don't hide out. Don't hide. But find a way to rise up. Find a way to do what my mentor told me, that a prophet must rise up and keep the learning and the burning. A prophet must rise up, keep the fire and the focus. A prophet must rise up and keep the keen mind and the clean life. Arise, prophets. Arise in a pandemic. Arise in all of this tumult and protest. Arise among the burning buildings. Arise among the broken bodies. Arise among the traumatized people. Arise! And tell the enemy, however the enemy shows up, The day of the Lord has arrived. And healing is in his hand. Power is in his hand. Deliverance, salvation is in the hand of the Lord on this great day. Lift those hands right where you're standing, right where you're sitting. We ask you, Lord, on this day of Pentecost, May we 
have the spirit of the living God. May it fall fresh on us. Just lift your hands right where you are and just receive the spirit. I know you may feel awkward doing it in front of your family, in front of your friends, at your home, with your roommate or others looking at you. But we're in a moment, an unprecedented moment in history. This country is teetering. It is a powder keg. Don't let the awkwardness of the eyes upon you keep you from lifting up your hands and saying, God, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. May I arise as a prophet, a prophet of, of, of worth and value in this season. May my unique voice and experience be able to deliver some bad news to the oppressors. Make room for the other voices that are coming. And certainly God, proclaim good news to the hurting among us. On your job, in your family, rise up prophet. Rise up prophetess. Boldly proclaim the words of the Lord that heal, that deliver and that set free. And we will declare it as done. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you today, people of the way, all of our friends and guests who've been watching and hanging out with us. I pray that you, even with this extended time, have experienced a unique encounter with God across the breadth and the spectrum of what it means to invite God into your lived real-time reality. Take this service you've experienced and cut it up into some smaller segments and rehearse these ideas that you heard from Pastor Ben, the lament that you heard from Pastors Erna and Pastors Tanisha, the prayers and the encouragement you heard from Minister Wayne, the videos, the trauma and healing conversation and even practices that you saw with Dr. Karina. And even this message, may we embrace the rise of the prophets in you. We are depending on you. We're depending on you. We're depending on you to help us as a people and as a nation get through this season. So arise, prophet, arise. I pray for us one last time as we prepare to end. God, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day of Pentecost. Thank you, God, for even this day that has, Lord God, been a commemoration of the first time you poured your spirit out post the resurrection of Jesus to a community of gatherers. God, I pray that in this 2020 year, Lord, that while the pandemic while the flailing of our country's political infrastructure, while the wickedness and the death dealing nature of our policing and criminal justice system still provides us with regular reminders of the presence of death, I pray that we will arise as prophets to boldly proclaim that death still does not have the final say and that we are now empowered to at times prophesy. Some of us are now empowered to continuously prophesy, but may all of us experience the salvation that comes from you. And so we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you in the name of the Lord. Have a wonderful Sunday. Mind all the announcements. Let's meet together this week as we start our Little fires everywhere. Pentecost, small groups, it's consecration this week, kicking off, it's time. Rise, prophets, arise. God bless you from the way in Jesus' name.